In this video, we're going to look at kinematics in two dimensions and a special case called projectile motion. We can track the motion of an object through space using an XY coordinate system. Here the position of an object at any point along its path can be given by XY coordinates. XY coordinates just give you the X and Y distances from the origin. You can also represent the position using a position vector that points from the origin to the object's location. If the object is displaced to a new position, we can represent this change in position as a displacement vector from the initial location to the final location. We can represent this new position with a second position vector. Based on our rules for adding vectors graphically, we can see that adding our first position vector r1 and the displacement vector delta r gives the second position vector. Rearranging this formula, we get our equation for displacement as the final position vector minus the initial position vector. We can represent each position vector in Cartesian form using its components and unit vectors. Writing the displacement vector in the same way by subtracting these position vectors, the components of displacement are just delta x and delta y, or the displacement in the x direction and the displacement in the y direction. Now we can look at the velocity. The velocity at any point is tangent to the path or trajectory of the object. This gives the direction the object is moving at the moment it's at that position. At any given point, the velocity may have an x and a y component. Like in one dimension, the average velocity is given by the displacement over time. In two dimensions, the x and y components of average velocity are given by the x and y displacements divided by time. We can also use calculus to express the components of instantaneous velocity using time derivatives. We can define acceleration in the same way. The acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. This is the definition of average acceleration, but when we look at cases of constant acceleration, this will again be the same as the instantaneous acceleration. So we'll drop the subscript. The instantaneous acceleration can also be written as the time derivative of velocity. Looking at these equations and our definition of acceleration, the direction of acceleration points in the direction of the change in velocity. We can see this by drawing two velocity vectors. Say an object begins with velocity v1, and a moment later the velocity changes to point along v2. To get the direction of the change in velocity, or delta v, we need to draw v2 first. Then we need to subtract, or move along minus v1. Connecting our starting point and ending point, we get the direction of delta v. This means the acceleration will point along this same direction. Notice that the direction of delta v, and therefore the direction of acceleration, are different from the direction of both v1 and v2. The direction of acceleration does not depend on v1 or v2 by themselves, only the difference. I've also drawn this acceleration and velocity vector together to illustrate the direction of acceleration. But you should remember that acceleration and velocity are two different quantities and they cannot be added or combined in any way. So the fact that I'm drawing them together is just to illustrate the direction. I can't add an acceleration vector to a velocity vector, for example. Also, we have found the direction of delta v graphically in order to find the direction of acceleration, but the magnitude or size of these arrows are not equal in general. To find the actual size of the acceleration vector, we need to divide delta v by the time interval. If the time interval is small, the acceleration will be large, which means the velocity not only changed from v1 to v2, but it did it very quickly in a short amount of time. If the velocity changed slowly over a large time interval, then the acceleration arrow would be smaller. Let's look at the relative directions of velocity and acceleration. In one dimension, there were only two cases. First, the velocity and acceleration could be in the same direction or parallel. This will lead to the velocity increasing in the same direction the object is already moving so it will speed up. In the other case, the velocity and acceleration are in opposite directions, or anti-parallel. Here the object is accelerating in the opposite direction that it is moving, so it slows down, or decelerates. If the directions of velocity and acceleration remain opposite, the object would eventually stop and then move in the same direction of acceleration, and then we're back to the case above. In two dimensions, we have another case. The acceleration can be perpendicular to the velocity, in this case, the object will not speed up or slow down, but it will change directions. I like to imagine moving the acceleration arrow to the tip of the velocity vector, as if the acceleration vector is turning the tip of the velocity vector. We get used to associating acceleration with speeding up and slowing down, 
But changing direction is also a type of acceleration. Vectors are defined by their magnitude and direction. So if the direction of a vector changes, it is a new vector. Since acceleration is the change in velocity, when velocity points in a new direction, this change is a result of acceleration. Also, remember that we can feel accelerations. When we're riding in a car that is cruising at the same speed in a straight line on a smooth road, we could close our eyes and feel like we weren't even moving. If the driver were to slam on brakes to decelerate, we would feel like we were being pushed forward. If the driver is going slow and quickly accelerates, we feel pushed back into our seat. But even if the speed doesn't change, if the driver turns very quickly, we will also feel pushed into the door since this is a type of acceleration. This is a good way to distinguish between velocity and acceleration, and we will explain why we feel accelerations when we discuss force. We can also have acceleration that has a parallel component and a perpendicular component to the velocity. This means the velocity will change direction due to the perpendicular component of acceleration, and the speed or size of their arrow will also change, but this will be due to the parallel component of acceleration. Now let's look at projectile motion. An object is considered a projectile, or is in projectile motion, if it only moves under the influence of gravity. This is the same definition of an object in freefall, but now our object is moving in two dimensions. We recognize that an object in freefall as an object that was launched straight up, an object that was released or dropped from rest, or an object that was launched downward. If we add an initial horizontal component of velocity to all of these cases, then we get a projectile. This means when an object is launched upward at an angle, or launched horizontally, or launched downward at an angle, it is in projectile motion as long as it moves without interacting or touching anything. When we add in this horizontal motion, our projectile will move along a parabola, or in a parabolic path. When we say an object is moving only under the influence of gravity, we mean the acceleration is due to gravity. In this case, gravity still only acts downward, so there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction or x direction. The acceleration in the y direction is still downward, and it still has a magnitude of little g, or gravitational acceleration. If we draw an arrow representing the initial velocity when the object was launched, and the angle theta the object was launched above the ground, or x-axis, we can use this to draw a right triangle. From here, we can find the x and y components of our initial velocity. With the angle relative to horizontal, the x component is given by multiplying by cosine, and the y component is given by using sine. Now, since the acceleration of gravity is constant near the surface of Earth, we can use our constant acceleration equations, or kinematic equations. I'll begin by writing all of these for the x direction. We can plug in our acceleration of zero into these equations. Looking at these two, the equations simplify, saying that the final velocity in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. This simply means that the x component of velocity isn't changing, but this is exactly what it means to have no acceleration in the x direction. Looking at the other equations, and keeping in mind that vx and v naught x are interchangeable, since they're equal, we can find the displacement in x is equal to the x component of velocity times time. Here, I've combined x minus x naught into delta x, or the displacement. This shows that we only really get one equation that we can use to find information about the horizontal motion. Now we can look at the kinematic equations in terms of y and plug in our minus g for the acceleration. These are the exact same equations we get for free fall, and we can use any of these depending on what information is known and what we are looking for. In free fall, we looked at what happened when an object lands at the same height it was launched from. We saw that the time the object spends on the way up is the same as on the way down and the speed at each height on the way up is the same as the speed at that same height on the way down. This is because the acceleration is constant, or the same on the way up as it is the way down. These are still true in projectile motion, since adding in a horizontal component of motion does not affect the motion in the y direction. We can also look at the distance an object would travel if it lands at the same height it was launched. We can write an equation for the x and y position and substitute v naught x and v naught y we found using our right triangle. We've taken the initial position to be the origin, so x naught and y naught are both zero. The displacement in the y direction is also zero, since the final and initial heights are the same. Now we want to solve our y equation for time. Then we'll substitute this formula for time into our x equation. 
We can rewrite this final equation using a little trig identity so that we only have one trig function instead of two, and now it's easier to use and analyze. So I've replaced X with a capital R, and this stands for the range of the projectile. The range is just the distance a projectile travels in the X direction or horizontally, and we call this equation the range equation. Notice the range depends on the initial speed V0 and the angle theta. When theta is zero, the range is zero since the object never leaves the ground. When the angle is 90, or the projectile is launched straight upward, sine of two times 90, or 180, is just zero. So the range is zero. This makes sense because the object should come straight down if it was launched straight upward. Finally, if we think about how to achieve the maximum amount of range, obviously we could always increase the speed, but for a given speed, what would be the optimal angle to fire a projectile? The sine function will be maximum when the argument is 90 degrees, since it increases up to 90 degrees and then decreases beyond 90 degrees. In our equation, we will get sine of 90 when theta is equal to 45. So this is the angle when our range is maximum. This also kind of makes sense. If the projectile is launched at too low of an angle, it won't be in the air long enough to go very far. But if we launch the projectile at too large of an angle, it will have a lot of hang time but not enough horizontal speed to move very far. A 45 degree angle is the sweet spot. This is true in projectile motion where there is only gravity. If we want to account for air resistance in the future, this will affect the object's trajectory and this angle might not be the same. I want to say a few things to keep in mind about projectile motion and solving problems. First, projectile motion is an extension of freefall motion. So everything from freefall applies and you should not forget all of the things you typically look for in freefall problems. The next thing is that since our object is moving in two dimensions, our position, velocity, and acceleration all have X and Y components. We take care of the X and Y directions separately and we use kinematic equations for each direction separately. This means we want to carefully add subscripts to label the direction we are looking at and also be careful not to mix the directions within an equation. Now the object is moving in both X and Y directions at the same time, even though they can be analyzed separately. The two directions are connected by time, which is the only quantity that will show up in equations for both directions. For example, an object can only move horizontally as long as it's in the air. But we know from freefall that the time of flight, or the time in the air, depends on the Y component of initial velocity and the height or Y position where the object starts and ends. This means we could use information about the object's vertical motion to find the time that it's in the air, and then we could take that and use it to figure out how far the object moves. Finally, say we want to find the overall magnitude of velocity or speed at some point along the path, or maybe the direction the projectile is moving at any given point along its trajectory. This means we need to combine the X and Y components using Pythagorean theorem and inverse tangent. The X and Y components are found using kinematic equations, and then we find the magnitude and direction of the overall vector just like we would with any other vector once we have the components at the time we're interested in. So that's it for the basics of 2D kinematics and projectile motion. We will also take a quick look at uniform circular motion before wrapping up kinematics in 2D. Then we'll begin to study forces and what causes and changes these types of motion. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.